Morning all, welcome to uh, this crazy Sunday. How many of you here are parents? How many of you are grandparents? <laughs> How many are moms and waiting wannabe parents? Thanks, Trudy. Wow, Rogers, there's something we don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, God works in mysterious ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the youngsters here. <laughs> so I, I'm a parent, so I'm a grandparent. I have, I'm a father of three, I think. Uh, I've got two girls and a boy, and I'm a grandfather of four, grandson and three children, and I have two bonus daughters, one of them who played on the stage. Well done to the, to the band today, right? So when my first daughter was on her way, when, when we ended up in the hospital, I was convinced that we were having a son. In those days, there weren't 4D scans, there weren't even 3D scans, I think they were 1D scans, and uh, they weren't very accurate, so you saw an arm, and you thought, oh, that's a torti, he's going to be a boy, so that was the, the right thing to do, right? <laughs> uh, but that's, that was the clarity that we had. So we were waiting in the delivery room, and there we are, and the, my wife's in labor, and out comes this child, and I say, congratulations, Bruce, you have a daughter. I said, no. No, no, check again, please, because um, this has got to be a son. They said, no, we're the professionals here. We know what we're doing. Um, this is definitely a daughter. And they hand you this child. And I had absolutely no idea what to do. No idea. They handed me a, a daughter. I was expecting a son. I was prepping in my mind a son. If they'd given me a son, I could have given him advice immediately, like my boy. When you get on your bike one day and you take a corner, you need to lean, because if you don't lean, you're going to eat dirt. And yes, you're going to ask one day, but it's okay to try and pee over the neighbor's wall. That's fine in my house. That's all good, you know. And um, never, ever support the blue bulls. No, that's the kind of advice that I would have given him. So... That, so they hand me a daughter, and I'm like, I um, actually got no idea what to do. And then they give you the kid, and they say, go home. Take this child home. Off you go. That's it. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> I think back on my life, back in our days, we had to get a license to get a dog. We had to get a license to feed my iguana. Like it needs to be fed grubs, and it needs to be do this. I had to get a license to fly an airplane. I had to get licenses for stuff in life, but they just give you this kid and they say, good luck. No license required. They don't give you any advice. It's just like, they off you go. You know, more recently, Alicia and I, we, uh, with this COVID thing, we had to modify our house because everyone's studying from home. And the girls in their bedrooms needed desks. So off Alicia goes and she buys their desks and they're all flat packed. And they come with instructions and a tool. A desk came with instructions and a tool, but you leave the hospital, nada, nothing. You haven't got a damn thing. And then you get home, and you've got to try and keep this child alive. You know, afterwards when my children grew up a little, they had this thing called a Tamagotchi. I don't know if you remember a Tamagotchi. It was like a little digital uh, um, child or an animal or a something. And I gave the Mishma, I said, okay, you go and try this. You see how you do with this. And so the journey starts. This parenting journey starts. And it starts as follows. Dale and Geordi sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage. Then comes baby in a baby carriage. Sucking his thumb, peeing his pants, doing the hula hula dance. That's where it starts. And we are beguiled in this love story that this... The story that's unfolding in front of us. And there's no manual. There's no manual for this. You guys have no idea what you're getting yourself into. You've got no cooking clue. Just like I had no idea. There's no manual. In the 60s, along came Dr. Spock. Who remembers Dr. Spock of that era? I was raised on the manual of Dr. Spock. Dr. Benjamin McLaren, I think, Spock. McLean Spock. He had some wisdom, and that was the book of choice back in the 60s, How to Raise Your Children. And basically, he was telling people, um, the basic premise to mothers was, you actually know more than you do. In later life, I've come to realize that there is another book on how to parent, and it's called the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. 
Bible. Bible. That's what my Bible stands for. The problem I have as a technology guy, there's no flow charts. There's no if-then statements. There's no diagrams. There's no branches out. If this happens, do this. and It's missing. Even in my Bible that I read, there's nothing like that. It doesn't even organize into structures, some parenting like groups. You know, if your, par- if your child does this, or if he's sick, or if he's going through, ah, there's no categorization of this kind of stuff in the, in the Bible. There's not even a parenting section that you can skim through and try and get some advice that I could find. That I could find. Instead, what I did find is that the Bible offers something completely different. Completely different. Cover to cover, it introduces you to the parent. The parent who engages his children, who loves on his children. And we get, when you read through Scripture, to watch him parent. How awesome is that? So there's no sections, but there's the heart of the Father. And reading the Scriptures, you will see exactly what he does. And our challenge is to emulate that in our lives, in in our families. How to relate to our kids is what's important to him. It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. Scripture's got a lot of principles, I think is the right word, right, on how to do it. It doesn't give you that exacting Dr. Spock thing. If he's got measles, do this. And it's, a, it's a holistic overview, and, and that's what I love about it. Proverbs 26, verse 7. Are we up? Oh. I put that in, not for the faint-hearted. Proverbs 26.7, like the useless legs of one who is lame is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. It's like trying to find that one solution, that one thing. Tell me how to parent. There's this one thing. You've got to do it like this. It doesn't exist. It's like that scripture says, finding, trying to find something. You, you, you're speaking like an ID10T. I think we call it in the IT terms, right? Uh, to be polite. There isn't one. However, our hope is fine in the one Parent, and those analogies that he looks, uh, it talks about in Scripture about, about parenting, him parenting us. That's what it's all about, and that's what we should be doing. Here's what I found. I found my teaching ground, my learning on how to be a parent, where do you think that started? At home. We went through a series, what was it called, most Emotionally Healthy Spirituality in this church, right? And then the big words that stuck out for me, I gave it a title, was this thing about your family of origin. Where did I came from? What, what was I subjected to? Where, and that's where you learn. Your parenting styles, you, are, you learn from your house of origin, your home of origin. And that's where you pick up, and that's how things were for you. Sadly for many of us, and certainly sadly for me, I was, my parents were from the post-World War II generation. I imagine what that household looked like with fathers that are missing, mothers that are being moms and dads, and there's war going on. There's absolute chaos in your house. And my particular scenario was my dad was born into this world, and just like I was expecting another kind of child, I was expecting a boy, my father was expected to be a daughter. They had no scans in those days. So out pops Richard Kingston Askham, and his mom said, mm, no, uh, I, I, I wanted a girl. And the trauma that started in his little life then was that because she so wanted a, a, a daughter, she used to dress him in girls' clothes. My dad walked around as a girl for years in his life because his mother rejected him because he wasn't, he wasn't what she wanted. Now, how's that for a family of origin? Imagine what his Life would have been like in that. And imagine that passed down and how he parented and came through. That's a mess. My question is, so what role models did you have? What was your family of origin? What did you learn? What did you take away from your parents? And the challenge to us as parents now is, what role model are you being for your parents, uh, for your kids? Because they are going to be little mini-me's one day. It's true, no? You can identify. Who can identify with this? <laughs> I, I, I grew up in an Afrikaans community. I was born English. We were born in an Afrikaans community. And at an early age, the different cultures and the different ways of parenting became very imminent in my life, very prominent in my life. 
we had it pretty easy besides my dad that wasn't around and always working and all those kind of things. My mom who had become mom and dad and used to, can I say the word blixem? Used to hit us a lot with like even a shambuck. You know, it started off with, with slippers and then it went to belts and then it went to wooden spoons with a happy face and a sad face. And then it, you know, we got all the tricks, Mr. Happy or Mr. Sad. What do you want, Bruce? You know, it's like I always got Mr. Sad. Um, anyway. And then it progressed onto belts, and the mom, you know, mom used to go and get my dad's belt, and it ended up with a shambuck. I, 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 I tease you not. <laughs> and it was very eminent to me, or prominent to me, that in the different cultures, now in the Afrikaans community, my observation at the time was that the Afrikaans parents were so strict. They were like this military kind of things. You will do it like this. You will set the table. You will deck it afterwards. You will do the dishes. You will make your bed. And if you don't, your footer. You know, that was the kind of culture that was there. And it became very apparent to me. Now, the number of times I used to go in the afternoon after school and visit some friends, and, and I'd find my friend lying in his bed crying. Why? Because he had been shambucked by his dad because he didn't do something right. You know, it's like, what's going on here? And I thought, my, tough, my stuff was bad, you know. My dad wasn't there. His dad was there, but he wished he wasn't there. You know what I mean? It's that kind of whole, that whole <laughs> dynamic, you know. And then, more recently, those of you that are doing the wholeness course, who's doing the wholeness course? Pretty awesome stuff, eh, so far. And one of the takeaways from the more recent thing is that analogy between father, mother, and siblings relating to, so your relationship with Father God is akin to your relationship with your father on earth. And oh my, my father wasn't there. My father was away. He was in the army. He was in the commandos in those days, whatever it was called. He was out working at NASA at the satellite tracking station. He wasn't around. So when I became saved, I had a struggle with this concept of a father, a caring, loving father in heaven. Dad, how are you being in your home? Emulate Father God. The next one was your mother figure. And it, it, it's akin in this wholeness course to the Holy Spirit. And my mom was this military disciplinarian. She had myself and my brother Grant. Oh my God. And we used to fight. You know, how he had children, to this day I still do not know. Because one of my favorite things was to give him a, a hoof every time we used to fight. That was our reality. We used to fight like cat and dog. He used to throw knives at me and I used to miss and he used to peg into the side of the cupboard. That's how naughty we were, you know. And, and no wonder there was a shambuck. You're right. So now, now, now the Holy Spirit steps into my life and I've got a, you know, he's this caring, tendering. Is it fallen off? No, it's there. Okay. <laughs> All right, we, we have technological trouble. So my challenge now is with the Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit is the lover, carer, tender, gardener, you know, all those kind of things in my life. And you, you're like my mom. Dude, I've got a challenge right here. And then Jesus is the symbol of your siblings. How are you getting on with those around you? It was war. So when I became a born-again Christian, that day that I gave my life to Jesus and said, I'm going to follow you, there was a turmoil going on in my head. You can just well imagine. And I wonder what that was like for you. And that's our reality. So my point here is, is that how is your family of origin? What are you doing in your homes? How does your home life look like? And what are you setting your children up to become? Wow, and that's no more small feat. That, that is quite some mean feat, right? I found it interesting that Jesus himself wasn't married. He never got married. He never enjoyed the fruits of parenting. Interesting thought that our Savior was that. However, Jesus was the son of earth. He was the son on earth that had a heavenly father. And like our analogy back to the Bible just now as to how we can do that. So as far as my kids are concerned, I am convinced. And we were joking just now. Gary was saying, you know, Bruce is preaching on, uh, on parenting. We're talking on parenting. And he was talking about you know, his kids, you know, the challenges that he has. Mine was a reverse, to be honest. My kids had those parents, <laughs> those challenging parents, not the challenging kids, because we had no clue. I was 21 when I got married. My wife at the time was 19 when we got married. Matric, just out. How, what do you know about? And her father was also, the, her family of origin was a challenge. Alcoholic father like mine, etc. Womanizing going on in the family and all that kind of stuff. Setting you up for 
and you put these two broken individuals together and say, here's your child, and it's a girl. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> and we come up with excuses, and we justify, and we, you know, we justify why we are like we are, because it is what it is, and I've, my dad's fault, and it's this fault, but never, never owning up yourself, never owning up. Fortunately for me, God stepped into the picture, and he put me on a journey, and it's been what an awesome journey of restoration and love to get you aligned and actually reveal his heart to you. And my son, this is how you do it. And there's always a second chance. We'll talk about that later. There's always a second, second chance. The part that I love about being a grandpa at the moment is that that's my second chance right now. I've been on a journey of restoration with my children, my own kids that God's put me on. But I have a ch second chance of parenting little ones. I can do it sort of better this time. And I can send them home afterwards, and that's all good. <laughs> So my, my topic today is uh, uh, parenting, right? And I don't know how I'm doing time. I don't, uh, I don't know. You, you'll, you'll just say Bruce shut up. So Ryan will know when we get in the classroom, we can either teach you to skydive in eight hours or five hours, and we normally do the eight-hour version. So we've got verbal diarrhea, but on we go. We soldier on. One of the things that I found, one of the tools that are in my toolbox, because we have a toolbox of stuff that you take with you, and you dip into it every now and then, and this child's doing this, let me try this one, uh, or let me try this one. And one of the helpful ones that I've found in life in general is this thing of setting boundaries. Setting boundaries. If you set personal boundaries, you've got the line. It's like having a fence around your house or a wall around your house where you're currently living. In this space is mine. In that space out there, not my problem. Not my problem. In this space, I will love, I can care, I can do, I can nurture, I can do things the way I intended to be with my family of origin and my upbringing and my learnings that I've had in life. Things that I'm good at. Out there, it's there. What's the purpose of a boundary? The purpose of a boundary is to keep the good stuff in and keep the bad things out. So one of the things I learned very late in life was this thing about boundaries and to be deliberate about setting those boundaries, because I'm sure you would know that if you don't set those boundaries, somebody or something else is going to set those boundaries. And what are the voices coming at us all the time in terms of boundaries? People out there, the internet, Facebook, social media. What does culture dictate? What are we saying? What, who's going to set those boundaries in your children's life if you're not enforcing those boundaries? And me, I had none. None. My wife and I ended up getting divorced and when that happened, there was chaos because there weren't any boundaries. I was this little military guy. You know, I was also an instructor in the army, so I had this military demeanor about me. And I was very hard. Well, I thought I was being. My kids thought it was a joke sometimes. But we got divorced, and I came to pick up my kids, and the, the, the dispensation we had at the time was I got my kids every second weekend. That was my, that's when I saw them. There weren't cell phones in those days. There wasn't much in terms of communication. Well, that was my excuse, which later on bit me in the bum. But the, uh, what was I talking about? Boundaries. Oh, my kids. We got divorced. And I came to pick up my kids one day, and my daughter walks out, and she turns around, and she's got a tattoo from the top of her spine to the bottom of her bum. This figure of leaves or something like that. Yo, where are these boundaries? What did this come in? Who allowed this? Mom or whatever the circumstance was. Earrings, not one. One, two, three, going up here. One on the top. Nose rings, eye rings. My one daughter had a tongue ring. What the heck is going on? Where these boundaries got blurred? They got obliterated. Why are you doing this to yourself? It's permanent. My daughter came to visit us yesterday, my eldest one, Darren. She's got tattoos. She says, oh, I should have listened to you. One of those things. I've got stretch marks now. I've had a kid. <laughs> I, had a, I had a tattoo done around my navel. It looks not the same. <laughs> not the same. <laughs> what happened? Boundaries. Boundaries were blurred. And in our circumstance, it got blurred because of our situation, right? Hebrews. <sighs> you can do it for me? Thank you. Hebrews, in order to run the race well, we need to shake off the things that keep us from reaching our goals. Shake off, parents. Shake off. It's you and your wife. Be in agreement. Be 
unified in your message that you're taking out into your family. Agree what that's going to look like. Agree what those boundaries are going to be. Because if you don't, they're going to become blurred. They're going to wipe out. They're going to be obliterated. Be in unity. Distractions. Set those boundaries. Don't let the world come in. Don't let social media come in. All those things we spoke about just now. Set the boundaries in your family's life. And pray to God that you're hearing from Him. That's our partnership now. I don't know how people of the world, and I use that term just like that, I suppose, people of the world, those that aren't born again, they don't have a spirit inside them of the Holy Spirit inside them. How do you do life? Who do you listen to? What's right? How much trial and error do you have in your life because you're not guided by our Heavenly Father? Thank you, Lord, for saving me that day and for saving us that day, that we actually have a plumb line of truth, a sense of truth that we can, that we can navigate around. Yes, it's not perfect. We're going to make mistakes, and that's fine. Make mistakes as a parent. It's all cool. Your parents did. You're going to, but more, be more line and make less of them and make smarter decisions. We'll talk about those just now. So my line, my, my, my takeaway from the boundary thing is if you don't set it, someone else is going to set it, right? That's the point. That's my point. And you might become very surprised or even dismayed at what your kids have learned if you don't set those boundaries. Number two, discipline and follow through. There's an old saying, an old scripture that says, spare the rod and spoil the child, right? Whoever spares the rod hates the son, but he who lives with him is diligent to discipline him. Personally, me, I believe that we should be disciplining our kids in firmness and in reason and in love. Firmness and reason and in love. Don't let your anger in the moment get the better of you. My wife at the time, my, little, my middle child was being particularly naughty one day, and there was this little teasing game. <laughs> you can't get me, you can't get me, whatever. And she was being naughty and tarting her ma. You know what I mean? And the Afrikaans, she was teasing her mom, and her mom went tilt, the trip switch went off, and she was after this child because she's going to discipline. Right? And she ran after this child, and as she came up behind, as she caught up this child, she whacked. And the child did a short left into the bar, and she hit her hand on the corner of the wall and shattered her wrist. Don't let your anger become the better of you, because those kind of things are going to happen. You're going to be a twit, you're going to have egg all over your face, and cool stories for your kids to tell one day for the rest of your life. So I believe that a spanking is not out of line. But the discipline that we have to give our children is not necessarily physical. It doesn't have to be physical. There's times when it may be, could be, should be, ought to be. That's all good. You, the parent, you decide what's good in your home. We, we spend a lot of time trying to control. We're trying to constrain our kids. We're trying to do this, and we use the stick. We use the rod. And yes, it's biblical in, in places. It's, it's fine. But the better thing is, what is the heart of your child right now? Why is your child reacting this way? What set of circumstances are there in your house that are bringing this out in them? Are they just being the naughty two-year-old? You discern. But if they're not, listen for the heart of the child before you bring out the rod. The heart of the child, children do not understand emotion. They do not understand how to effectively communicate, especially when they're youngsters. So they're going to act out. They're going to say things. They're going to do things. And our job as parents, especially for the younger generation, is to find what are those triggers. Why are they there? Find the heart of the child before you bring out the rod. Proverbs. God Proverbs 4.23, God is concerned with your heart. God is concerned with the heart of your child as well. <laughs> uh, my kids, uh, three of them, bless their souls. I hope they're not listening to this because I'm going to get lambasted. Um, but anyway, I, um, I had one of those moments where my own trip switch went off and I said, now, nah, genoeg is genoeg. And the story I, uh, I was reminded yesterday by my daughter was I bought them a slip and slide, those crazy things from hell that you can break bones and laugh about it, okay? And you lay it out on the lawn and you wet it and you go skedaddling and you whoop and hopefully you stop somewhere and you get roasties and all that. And I bought the kids one of those and had it in the garden. And my rule was, because I'm trying to put boundaries in place, kids, you play this thing, you pack it up after. That's part of your job. I've spent 
two, I don't know how much bucks it was in the day, three, four hundred rand on this, on this, this killing machine, uh, a fun machine for you, and you put it away after. Guess what happened? Next afternoon, I get back from work, and the thing has been devoured by two boxes that we had at the time, box of dogs. They, weren't, they were sprinklers now, they weren't slipping. It was, it was very rough. You would get roasties on them if you went down. So my trip switch with goes off and I come, 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 come. No, pa, this is what's going to happen now. The Afrikaans comes out on me, you see, as it does on occasion when my trip switch goes off. And I say, come. And the closest thing I could find was my slip stop. And I said, all right, all three of you are going to get six of the best. But it's going to work like this. You're going to bend. I'm going to give you one. You then go around to the back of the queue. The next one, two. You go around to the back of the queue, three. And I did this repeatedly, doing the circle dance. And I thought I was being so strict. And I thought I was really, because it was a hard plucky. It wasn't one of these softer ones. You know, I thought I was dishing. They were in their jammers, so it was also thin, you know. So I thought I was doing the right thing. And I'm whacking these kids. I need to find out later, yes, they actually thought it was a joke. And they laughed at me, and they still think it's a huge, a huge joke, you know. But in my trip switch went off, control your anger, control your situation, and do sensible things. That previous scripture about being a fool, don't be a fool. And that, maybe that was foolish, maybe it wasn't. If your child knows you are fair, you're not going to lose his respect. If you're fair and consistent all the time, make sure that the punishment fits the crime. Don't whack your hand off on the wall because she dropped a cup of water, for example. You know? Even the youngest of kids have a keen sense of justice and what's right and what's wrong. It's innate in us, right? So they know. They know when things aren't a kid. Point number three. We've still got time. Envisage what your child can be. Know your child. Each child is an individual person and should be treated as such, as an individual. Each child of God is an individual and God treats, treats us individually. So we should, could, ought to extend the same to our children. You see this often in business where the business management come and they say, HR department, and here's a big brush. Whoosh, we're all going to paint you all with this brush, and that's how things are going to work here, and that's good and well. But each individual person has got their own dreams, aspirations, challenges at home, where they want to be in life, how long they're going to be with the company, and, 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 and. And that's where my, my wife, Leisha, where she shines in the space as an HR, because HR, the traditional HR is, how many days leave have you got, and what contract, and all the admin, 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 and no one readily looks at the heart of people in the organizations. Someone like Leisha steps into the picture who has a pension for people, they've got a business of 40 odd people, and she's making a huge difference. Why? Because she's applying that principle of envisage what that person can be in business. Same for you as a parent. Try and find the heart of your child and treat each child as an individual because they are. In God's eyes, they're individuals. So, you've got a nerdy or a geeky child. Dad, be a nerd or a geek with that child. Dad, you've got a child that's va ville and he wants to go and race motorbikes and jump out of there. Dad, go and do that with your child because that's the individual care and attention. Each one is so different. Someone needs TLC. Someone needs to rough it. You get the idea. Treat each child as an individual and that, that would get you the right way, even if they are nerdy and geeky. My problem with this was, my eldest daughter, Darren, she says, she, in school she loved history. And in my mind, somewhere along the line, I had realized or heard that lawyers love history. Because if you love history and you have a pension for history, what are you going to do? You're going to remember dates, you're going to remember court cases, you're going to do all those lawyer things that lawyers do. So, Dad, what should I become? A lawyer. But, but, but don't worry, my child, you've got history, you've got this thing waxed, you can become the best lawyer in the whole world. Yes, I'm parenting 101, you telling my kid and forcing her down this road. She signs in at UCT, she does one and a bit years of, of law, hates every moment because there's a massa matematis and all these kind of Latin phrases that, that's not history, but she's got to know all this stuff. I helped her and encouraged her down the wrong road. If I'd known my child, which I do now, <laughs> she is an artist. She has a penchant 
for painting and sculpting and drawing and telling stories. That's my child. But this dad, at the time, law, because you're going to achieve. I didn't achieve that greatly in my life yet. I had a problem with that previously. You know, you try and you're going to die trying to do all this kind of stuff. And you're not going to be like me. You're going to be a success. Go and make a success of your life and go and do all the things that I couldn't do. Careful. Careful. What are you doing? I'm not knowing my child. I'm not helping my child. I'm not coaching, guiding my child into what their gifting, what their calling is, and what their alignment and God's plan is with them. Because I wanted it my way. Be careful. My takeaway from this point is be careful what you do because every child is a gift from God. The biggest, bestest gift you could ever receive in your life is a child. Love on them. Treat them the way God would. And don't do the fatherly, motherly, brotherly, community thing for them. You're going to be just like your uncle so-and-so because no, maybe that's not what they need or that they want. Get to know your kids. The next one. Did I put the scripture up? Psalm. Oh. In the Psalms. This, this is for that point. David found great comfort and security knowing that God is relational, that, not, that God not only knew about him, but that he knew him intimately and discerned all the details of your life. Copy, paste, child. There you go. How awesome would that be? From Scripture. Next point. Don't prevent suffering with your children. That was a big learning for me. Helicopter parent. Helicopter parent. Do this, don't do that. Oh, hovering over them, preventing, curing, curbing, curtailing. No, no, no. Let your kids fail. Let them fall down. Let them graze their knees. Let them get hurt. Let them be dumped by a, a, a lover. Let them lose at a game, at Monopoly. Don't make them all winners. That's so unhelpful. Let them feel the sting of defeat in their own lives, helicopter parent. What you're going to do is you're going to create children that can fall down, that can pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and carry on. Where's mom? Where's dad? Unhelpful. Let your kids fail. It is okay to fail. My story of failing in this department is I seriously had this conversation with my children. I sat them down when they were all in their teens, and I said, children, here's my message for you about succeeding at life and about preventing suffering. I was in a place of suffering. I was in a place of my marriage was falling apart. I didn't have money. My business was failing. And I wanted to help them to get on in life and make them not suffer. Here was my counsel, failing at Dad 101. Children, when you get married, marry twice. Seriously? Marry twice. The first time, find the richest dude you can find on the planet. <laughs> Marry him, divorce him, take half, and then go and find love the second time. As God is my witness, that was my counsel to my children. As a father, failing, 101, loser, loser. Wow. My issues became my child's issues, and I gave them sound counsel. <laughs> Oh uh, dear. Train up the way we heard about the scripture just now. Uh, that he should go, a child should go, and he, when he is old. And uh, where's Lee? Lee, you were reminding us at Life Group about the scripture. I decided to use it. Train up a child in the way he should go, but when he is old, <laughs> that he will not depart from it. Guys, what an encouragement. What a challenge. Don't prevent them from suffering. Train them up. Teach them that life has got its ups and its downs, its valleys and its highs, its mountains and its dips. And you're going to experience those, and it's okay. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be there as your safety net. I'm going to be there to love on you. When you fall down and you need help or you need guidance, came to I, I want to spoke to you a question. That's fine. And they know that you'll be the safety net regardless, but let them go. Let them go.
<laughs> Another thing that are in the same topic was in, in sub, uh, preventing pain is never lie to your children. Never lie. White lies, half-truths. Um, kids are smart. They know you're full of it. They know, ah, oh, Dad, come on. <laughs> it's not really true. Why? Because they know they're smart. They're wise. You lie to them, it's okay for them to lie to you. Where were you last night? Uh, out with a friend. Okay. Facebook. Bah, party at ball breakers or wherever they've been and potting it up, smoking it up. They're lying to you. Why? Because you set the tone in your home. And I did that. Do these stories sound familiar? Easter Bunny? Father Christmas? Tooth Fairy? Truth? Half truth? Non truth? Does it matter? Don't care. <laughs> it's not the truth. Not the truth. Don't be that helicopter parent, is my point. Leading by example. Next one. Can I still go? Okay, two. Leading by example. Lead by example. Show kids what to do. Don't tell them what to do. There's a lot of things that my dad didn't do, but some of the things that he did do is he showed a lot of stuff, not necessarily directly to me, but he showed how to build a house, how to run a farm, how to grow chickens, how to prune grapes. He didn't tell me about it. It wasn't an academic thing. He did it. He did it with me. He did it for me. And that's my encouragement to you as children, to you and your children, is uh, tell them to dream big. Don't just tell them to dream big. Show them how to dream big. This is who you are. This is what God, this is what I see God's unlocking in you, in your life. Step out and let me help you. Come beside you and let me help you and show you on that journey to go and do stuff. Otherwise, you become an academic. You know, I can think about stuff, but I can do squat. I mean, that saying, do as I, what's it, do as I, don't do what I say, do, do whatever. Don't do what I do, do what I say. Yeah, anyway, you get the point. <laughs> Similarly, we tend to always focus on the practical stuff in life, the, stuff, the workings. You, know, you can do this to get ahead and do this to get a job and do this to fix a lawnmower and whatever the practical thing is. But we forget, as my parents did and as I certainly did because that whole sins of the father thing came down, right, is what about your kid's spirituality? We are physical beings, but we're on a spiritual journey. What is your spirituality leading look like? How are you with your kids in a discipline, uh, in a spiritual discipline component, an aspect of their lives? <laughs> Mine was extreme. My little son, Ryan, I grew up as a fighter. I was a little English boy, went to an Afrikaans school. Then I was an Afrikaans boy that went back to an English high school. And Dell and I shared the story. And I became this fighter. I even took up boxing lessons because I was going to block some anybody that tried to tell me what to do or that came in my space because that's the way in my culture, my, my family of origin was. It was that fighting talk, you know, it was that. So my son grows up and I say, you've got to learn self-defense, my boy. You've got to learn how to defend yourself because the bullies are coming. And they are. Maybe I was reflecting on my history, but they are, and life is like that. So you're going to do karate. You're going to do karate. And off he goes. There's a little, I don't know, five-year-old, white belt. And a couple of months or years later, he's got a yellow belt. And I don't remember all the colors. A brown belt, green belt. And eventually he became a junior black belt. And he has this oak doing cutters and kicks and styling and going to competitions and knocking the heck out of people. And yes, and I'm on the sidelines really because he can defend himself. God steps into my life. And I become born again. And I have a mother that's on one extreme of spirituality or Christian, Christian walk. And my boy, Bruce, my mom says to me, you know that uh, karate, where's its origins? It's in the East. And she goes off on this whole bent and I, I absorb and I acknowledge this. It's not from God. It's not, you know, it's not good for my child. And here's my little boy fighting his karate. And I come to him and the next day, he's won a competition. The next day I say, my boy, this stuff is bad. Like, I mean, B-A-D, capital bad. You are to stop it because they're setting up for spiritual failure and, and, and. It's demonic and all that kind of stuff. And my boy's sitting, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. What's going on now? Like, Dad, you wanted me to do this. And now the next day, nada, stop it. Consistency. Consistency in leading by example. Know your stuff. Research your stuff. Help your kids properly. Don't do this. Uh... Teach your children to love God and not to love men. That will help. 
Gary's, one of Gary, Gary's sayings. If you give a child a deep and abiding faith in God, it can be his strength and his light when all else fails. Tell them about Jesus. So parents, when you're parenting, leading by example, practically, good stuff. Spiritually, even better stuff. Do that for your kids. And again, I don't know, I don't know how... Lastly, I'll, I'll land with this one. Don't be hard on yourself. You come with baggage. You come from a family of origin. You've got stuff that, are, that is yours, that is ingeent. It's etched into your being because of where you came from. You learned from what you were subjected to. You learned in the school of hard knocks on how to be a parent. There's no manual, like I said. And if your journey was anything like mine, I came to Christ later on in life. 2000, so 2003, April Fool's Day. God was got a sense of humor. April Fool's Day, 2003, he saved my soul. Because <laughs> these stories, were, some of them are pretty hectic, right? Don't be hard on yourself. Forgive yourself daily because you are not perfect. You're not Jesus. You're not going to win at everything. You're not going to be the absolute bestest according to Spock, even according to the Bible. You, you, a lot of stuff, you're going to wing it. And that's, Don't be hard on yourself. Know that you are just human. Give yourself space to grow as a parent. Give yourself space to grow as a grandparent in this season of your life. One of the big things is to admit your mistakes. We duff it on a daily basis. Imagine the heart, imagine the atmosphere and the vibe and the culture you're putting in your house when you duff it and you say, I'm sorry. Not <laughs> do what I do, do what I say kind of attitude. Be the first to own up if you've made a mistake. You've got stuff in, your, in our lives. We've got deep, dark stuff. We've got hard stuff. We've got all those kind of emotions that hang. Kids see it. And if you're free and fair and open with your communication, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be open, free and fair with their communication back to you. Why? Family of origin. Because that's how things happen in my world. That's how things happen in my home. That's how things happen in my life. I made some bad mistakes, and I'll end with this one, with my children. Somewhere in my life, I heard a story of teaching your children how to swim. And that if a child ends up in the swimming pool, they will automatically roll onto their back, their head will come out, and they will goof to the side and cling onto something. Ha! Huh. I'm standing by the side of the pool. My wife wasn't there at the time, thank God, because I would have been shot. My daughter, Nicole, the middle child, she's got middle child syndrome. You know what that is, right? Out of the three. And she's like scared of the water. And Dad steps into the picture and picks up my child and tosses her into the pool. Swim! And I watched my daughter drown. Or drowning. She didn't drown. I was there to save her. There was no way she was going to drown. But imagine this child being tossed in the water with her parent thinking out of good intentions, I'm going to teach her to swim. And all I see, gluck, 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 and there's water over her and his face. And she's like, you know, you, in your mind, you see, you, you're seeing her lipping. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, Dad? What are you doing, Bruce? Trauma invoked in that child's life still this day. To this day. Why? Because I was that fool. I was that fool. I didn't have the tools. I didn't know what to do. And I blamed it for years and years and years on my family. Dad's fault. Mom's fault. You made me like this. I didn't own nothing because I was perfect. Number seven on the Enneagram, right? We do nothing wrong. We're in charge of everything. We go. Mm. The lesson there was, well, the scriptures there, there's many. There's many scriptures of not being hard on yourself. The learning for me there is, I was always told, cowboys don't cry. Suck it up. Suck it up. Move along. Cowboys don't cry. Later on in life, I learned that cowboys maybe don't cry in front of their horses. <laughs> but they do cry. And what I've subsequently learned is that powerful men do cry. Because you're in touch. You're in charge. You're in charge with your emotions, your physical. We, guys, in particular, we've got chromosomes. Do you know that? Chicks have got two X's. And, and we won't talk about our X's, but we've got an X and a Y. We've got an X and a Y. So we've got male hormones chromosomes, and female. We've got why. Get in touch with your feminine side. It's okay to cry. I think so. I do it a lot. <laughs> I'm going to close there. So, guys, there's hope. There's hope in this. How do you parent 
practically? How do you parent realistically? God's own kids in the garden didn't listen to him. Adam, Eve, ring a bell? His own kids didn't listen to him. Don't take it personally. There's hope, but there's hope in parenting when you partner with the big dude in the sky called Holy Spirit, the one that comes and dwells in, the one that guides you, leads you. And no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what mistakes you are making, there is forgiveness, there's hope. If you parent in love, make your base love. And all those pointers in the toolbox, those are my toolbox. Some of them helpful, some of them not. I've got others, but we'll have to do another preach another time on this. And it's even better. God doesn't promise to fix all your stuff, but what he does promise is he commits himself to work with you. He commits himself to work in you with the relationship with your child to accomplish what he has for you in your family. This gives me confidence to carry on parenting, although I duffed it badly, badly. Like I said, world's worst dad, 101, before God stepped into my life because I was doing things my way. I did it my way. Don't tell me nothing. I did it my way. Allow God, allow the Holy Spirit into your life and lead and speak from that point. I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. God bless you all and happy parenting. Youngsters, youngsters, hear some of the things that are happening here today. Don't judge your parents. That's not what it's about. But one day you too are going to be parents. And keep some of these things in mind. It'll set you up for an awesome time. Thank you.